Blessed Lord, fasted for 40 days and 40 nights for as part of your perfect obedience that comes to our account. Give us self-discipline in our sanctification. Amen. But we're with in Leslie Williams' emblem of faith untouched, a short history of Thomas Cranmer, chapter 2, Cambridge Years. Blessed Lord, who's caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may in such wise hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that by patience and comfort of thy holy word, we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which thou hast given us in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In 1500, higher education in England was beginning a radical transition in thought, curriculum, and method, reflecting a major shift in worldview. So a student entering Cambridge in the early 1500s could expect a new course of study, not the old medievalism taught in the past centuries. However, the transition in studies was gradual. Scholasticism had ruled the university since the 12th century as a method in which scholars attempted to reconcile, synthesize, or resolve tensions between faith and reason. Augustine provided the maxim for scholasticism. Understand so that you may believe. Believe so that you may understand. Though the Holy Spirit was still the supreme source of the knowledge of God, reason illumined by God was duty bound to investigate and expound Christian authoritative information. When the questions of faith were argued in a series of dialectics, the two sides of an argument could be made whole or resolved through formal logic. Closely linked with philosophy, scholasticism was a serious attempt to reconcile the major questions of life and faith, and it continued to be a method of study when Cranmer got to Jesus College. The curriculum had been revised in 1488 to reflect the different approach, the new trend of intellectual thought. Humanism, the rising current of philosophy and literature, was prevalent among Renaissance thinkers and helped fuel the Reformation. Humanism shifted the focus from the next life to this one, emphasizing human dignity as a central concern, along with the value of the individual, beauty as a deep inner virtue, and worldly achievement and pleasures. Academic study shifted from interpretation to original sources including newly discovered classical texts as the ancient languages of Latin and Greek. Cranmer entered this maelstrom of thought in 1503. You can see this retro retrojection back into history. Beginning a four-year program at Cambridge, classical literature for the first two years, logic in the third and philosophy in the fourth year, matriculating with a BA. The next course of study was the MA, which included arithmetic, <coughs> music, geometry, and astronomy. With no formal professors, with no professors of formal classes, the Cambridge teaching system employed masters, men who had passed the MA and had been licensed by their university colleagues to tutor. These masters taught the younger students by assigning reading and giving examinations that consisted of oral arguments over questions the students put forth. Students held these disputation first with senior students, then with masters. The method of learning continued as scholars rose in academia and gained degrees. The masters studied and disputed with the doctors in divinity, canon, and civil law and medicine, 
and eventually themselves became doctors grouped into specific faculties. As a student, Cranmer may have been exceptionally thorough or may have simply been slow because it took him a long time to get his first degree. Cranmer apparently had the bad luck to suffer from peevish masters. In addition, the college tutor toyed with material he didn't understand, making things up or simply skip the material, making it more difficult for Cranmer to pull his studies together. Fox claims Cranmer's delay was caused by the state of education in England, which was in transition from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance. Early on, many fine writers were neglected, and the schools and universities were reluctant to abandon the old filthy barbarousness Cranmer plodded through scholasticism, searching for many more. At any rate, it took Cranmer eight years to get his B.A. In graduating class were several good friends who later became his chaplains, and Hugh Latimer, a fellow martyr. A few years behind him, his future antagonist, Stephen Gardner, was beginning his undergraduate career. At this point in life, Cranmer was short, with pure and sanguine complexion, with lively eyes and sanguine that lively eyes that bore out from under dark, bushy eyebrows. While Cranmer was quietly building his reputation as a scholar, Gardner, the son of wealthy cloth merchants, was already becoming famous. Latimer and Gardner were to play a large part in Cranmer's future. In 1511, several events coincided. Cranmer finished his bachelor's degree and started his master's, which he finished in a timely manner in 1515. Also, the famous Dutch Christian humanist Erasmus received a lectureship as the Lady Margaret's reader in divinity. Erasmus translated the Greek Novum Testamentum, published in 1517 setting the heather on fire with his new ideas. Erasmus wrote in his preface to his translation that it was important to make the Bible available to everyone. Which was a radical notion for time. The mysteries of kings it may be safer to conceal but Christ wished the mysteries to be published as openly as possible. I wish that even the weakest woman should read the gospel and the epistles of Paul. I long that the husband should sing portions of them to himself as he follows the plow, and the weaver should hum them to the tune of his shuttle, that the traveler should beguile with their stories the tedium of his journey. The Latin translation with swarms of footnotes formed a basis on which both sides of the religious controversy were to build. With a 21 year age difference between them, Cranmer and Erasmus probably were not friends. Nonetheless, Cranmer could not have helped escaping his influence. Years later, when Erasmus's patron, Archbishop of Canterbury, William Warren died, Cranmer continued to support him financially. The following year, 1517, Luther came out with his 95 theses, adding fuel to the blaze, and further opened the door for questioning the church's authority in scripture and in practice. These new themes played loudly in the background when Cranmer, as a layman, was elected to Jesus College as a fellow. From the first to the last, Cranmer began collecting texts, buying secondhand books that he later preserved in his expansive library, one of the finest in England. He wrote notes in the margins, jotting down his responses, objections, summaries, themes, and related ideas from other authors. At some time between 1515 and 1519, Cranmer's life took an odd twist. 
living, dining, studying, and teaching at Jesus College, Cranmer was required to remain single, even though he had not been ordained nor taken a vow of celibacy. During this time, a tenant of Jesus College's foundation owned the best local club where fellows of the college hung out and put up with out-of-town visitors. The owner's wife had a niece or relative who worked for her, apparently an attractive woman, who brought business to the pub. Cranmer fell in love and married this woman. Her name was Joan. A rash decision for an otherwise cautious man, his marriage cost Cranmer a great deal in many ways. He was forced to resign as a fellow of Jesus College and take on a demeaning post, lower both in pay and prestige, as a reader at Buckinghamshire College. He had to move out of Jesus College, where he had been ensconced for the past 12 years or so. Though his new wife lived in the Dolphin Inn, Cranmer moved elsewhere probably to Buckingham College, where he could devote himself to his work with diligence. However, Cranmer often visited his wife at the inn, causing ta wag tongues to wag. In fact, this domestic situation created grief for him later on, when his Roman Catholic enemies insulted the squire's son by calling him an hostler and not a true scholar. Without much documentation, Cranmer's love affair with Joan has sprouted many rumors in the fertile imaginations of those eager to present, present him in the light of their own particular basis. Though many say Joan was simply the relative of an innkeeper's wife, others promote her to the daughter of a gentleman. Her last name was Black or Brown. No one is sure. According to those who wish to cast aspersions, <clears throat> Joan and Cranmer married because she was pregnant. In keeping with his nature as a private person, <clears throat> Cranmer did not leave much public or personal information about his wife. We do know that their marriage lasted a short time, around a year, ending abruptly when Joan died in childbirth. For a man willing to sacrifice so much for love and honor, the death of Joan and the baby must have grieved him deeply, and the tragedy changed the course of Reformation history. Had she not died, Cranmer would have lived out his life as a happily married man. However, he would have been denied further study, ordination, and appointment as the Archbishop of Canterbury. Stranded and bereft, Cranmer reapplied to his old position as fellow at Jesus College, where he was taken back into the fold. His re-election, a tribute to his scholarly ability in the eyes of his colleagues. His reinstatement was an honor even more special, because widowers were usually excluded because they had not been bound by the celibacy statutes. Once he moved back into Jesus College, he continued his studies. As theological debates began to heat up on the continent and England, Cranmer studied all sides of the religious issue for the next 10 years, reading a variety of writers, spent three years studying the scriptures in depth. Grounded in scripture, he read old as well as new authors and was not swayed to any one point of view. He withheld judgment and kept his opinions quiet. He was a slow reader, but an earnest marker. Cranmer took careful notes and organized them under various topics of controversy. For long-winded authors, he developed a system of notation for further review. His theological beliefs at this time are difficult to pin down. Notes from the margins of his book reveal that he was a papalist, but even more so a conciliarist, a traditional academic with humanist, but not Lutheran sympathies.
Cranmer was a plodding scholar by all accounts. Some biographers claim that his deliberation and slow methods reveal a mediocre mind, but others claim that his study habits proved the opposite. The final assessment of his mind's development lies in the quality of texts he wrote later. For example, the precise and brilliant brilliance of the Book of Common Prayer reveals a careful, deliberate reader, taking time to absorb and assimilate an, ar an array of ideas, a wide spectrum available and stimulating thought, as well as the ability to select le mot juste for clarity and beauty. Cranmer continued to study and work hard. In 1526, he became a doctor of divinity. There we are, old debate there. 1523 or 1526. Also, he became ordained in 1520 in the wake of Joan's death. With his new credentials, he served as one of the learned men who examined the yearly or candidates for commencement, those receiving either bachelor or doctor of divinity degrees. Each candidate had to be approved and licensed by the whole university in order to proceed. Not surprisingly, as an examiner of potential candidates, Dr. Cranmer favored a firm knowledge of scriptures. He passed only those candidates who proved substantial, a substantial familiarity with the Bible. He rejected friars and other religious people who were brought up without studying the scriptures. As a result, many dreaded his rigorous and severe examinations Yet those whom he forced to study the scriptures later thanked him. An example, Dr. Barrett, a white friar, who moved to Norwich and later applauded Dr. Cranmer for rejecting him to, so, so he could amend his ways. Cranmer grew in knowledge and reputation. When Cardinal Wolsey took power under Henry VIII. He tried to tempt Cambridge scholars to join his newly founded and lavishly funded Cardinal College in Oxford, picking out the best in their fields. Dr. Capon, that would be the master of Jesus, nominated Cran Cranmer in his talent search in the 1520s. Cranmer declined to board the gravy tank train at the risk of offending people in high places. Some might have said that his refusal ruined his chances for advancement, but this proved not to be the case. He continued at Cambridge, soaking up different sides of the increasingly inflammatory issues. Cranmer's personality played as distinct and important role in English history as did his scholarship. Position and intelligence he was compassionate, unassuming, and personable. Even one of his bitterest biographers praised his personality. He had in favor a dignified presence, adorned with a semblance of goodness, a considerable reputation for learning and manners so courteous, kindly, and pleasant that he seemed like an old friend to those whom he encountered for the first time. By the end of the 1520s, Cranmer appeared content and comfortable with his life in academia, desiring to spend the rest of his days in Cambridge. He was at peace, not troubled by ambition, wealth, power, or status. He would turn 40 in 1529, but in the church, changes were on the horizon. Perhaps the most important change for Cranmer's future was the news that Henry VIII wanted an annulment from Catherine, the Spanish Queen of England. Here ends chapter two. Glory be to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost.